to explain some of these features of that game. And believe me, I consider it very relevant to the comics I was talking about. Remember, those comics are the ones that the creators of Champions and those other games were deeply, deeply engaged in. That, to them, is the superheroes, the, the comics. That period, which, as I want to point out, is forgotten in many, many ways. Or bodlerized, um, or its memory and the discussion of it is deeply distorted. So, okay, let's take a look at what I did with uh, a beta playtest of Champions Now. Um, I made almost done characters, had the character the players complete them. Uh, I provided two statements about what this game was kind of its context. Um, it was set in Hartford, Connecticut. And so we sat down and just played this session. Um, as you can see, it's important to me to play in a location that one of the players is very familiar with to use as much of it as I can to learn more about its history and its geography. Um, I, as a single session that I really wanted to be very active, um, I had set up something that otherwise would only develop in play. These are my notes for it, which shows all the crazy things about what was happening with each character and terms of their efforts toward any of the other characters and it just, you know, was, was nuts. And that's, I said, all right, everybody, we're going to pretend this comic has existed for three or four years. And this is the double size summer special where all sorts of crazy plots all come together and everybody's got an opinion and, you know, go. So it was quite a lot of fun. And I want to look at the features of the game, um, that, it has a point build design that um, the character's sense of identity for themselves and society are uh, rather, you know, emphasized, particularly in terms of relationships. The characters have viewpoints and obsessions that are extremely specific. Um, outcomes in the moment tends to be unpredictable. You don't know how it's going to go. Um, there's a, a feature to that kind of use of dice, which kind of died away in the years during you know, during the late 80s where dice either were sort of intrusive or they told you what you already knew. Here, the dice are kind of like, you know, loaded. That's not the right word, is it, for dice. The dice are um, pregnant with possibility uh, when they, they boom, when they hit the table. And you're like, okay, everything's changing now. Um, particularly also champions of that era uh, really had no definition of heroism. And the morality of the characters was not baked into the game. There's not even a section talking about what is a hero, except to say, as far as we can tell, heroes help people, but do as you will with that idea in your game. Um, there is no framework of theme or acceptable outcomes in early champions. Uh, looking at the point build design, uh, some of you are going to recoil in horror from this second edition sheet. Um, and I will point out, though, that there's some surprising things about the points. Unlike all point build games to come, including later editions of Champions, the, the points are not Legos. They are not atoms. Um and for example, you know, if you were to make up Dr. Doom in this system, you would not have to invest points into being the ruler of Latveria. You just say he is. Tony Stark's a millionaire, a zillionaire. You just say he is. Um, same thing with skills. Peter Parker's a photographer. You just say he is. There's no photography skill. Um, so the the point build is also fascinating in that it is not merely descriptive there are constraints built in both mathematical and overall quantitative that is to say how much where you are effectively forced to be less powerful and to do less than you wanted and that you get more problems than you want so when you say make it fit by having this number of points, you know, match that number of points, it's not about balancing advantage and disadvantage at all. It's about pushing you into sort of a creative crisis of saying, 
well, what other problem am I willing to bake into this concept? And what, uh, how, how can I do these powers so that I can live with their level of effectiveness? It still matches what I want this guy to be about, but it's now going to be more about where they can go from here, not about all the things they can do. Um, furthermore, that an essential piece of the point build design for this game is that you're going to get more and the character will change. And it's going to be slow, but it's going to be very steady. And in practice, people are often amazed at just how much their character can change. This is a little different from later games in which the point build is extremely completist, extremely portraiture oriented. And in those games, you'll find that they're not very well built to deal with more points coming in. Um, they, they, they sort of flail. I mean, you, you, you made the perfect picture. Now you're messing it up. This is very different. So there's a couple of other points about this that I want to raise to you. Um, that here, the description of what a given power does is customized by you. All of the, the rules are generic, but it's not a skin. That the, the, the game is very explicit about how the special effects, you know, this is an ice blast, this is a fire blast. The game is extremely specific about how this has rules heavy impact. And you can formally put those things into place with, uh, with these modifiers called advantages and limitations, but you don't have to. The special effects in and of themselves are quantitatively important rules. And that's, that's very unusual, and it was lost very fast. None of the other superhero games did that, except, again, perhaps for the original vid Villains and Vigilantes. And none of the other games that followed, I should say, did that. And um, in many cases, you know, it, it's axiomatic that these descriptions are skins. The rules are going to do only what they do. And if you want them to do something else, then you have to take a modifier. Well, no, this is very different back then in this game. So we move on to uh, some of the other issues that I talked about for the game, which is that they really focus on the identities of the characters as problems. And then I thought, problems, really? And that's why I changed it to the name Situations, eventually. That when you look across what the game calls at the time disadvantages, what you see is that they are mostly in place because of the character's choices. And they are also just situations that they're going to face. They're going to wake up in the morning and some aspect of one of these is going to be operating. And so all of a sudden you get the idea of a character in motion. This is where their choices have brought them. These are the next steps of the consequences of these choices. Looking at the characters that I did for that Hartford game, you'll see that uh, here I have put in red the identity-based and relationship-based aspects. You can see that they've got hunting characters. They've got situations with how they relate to the public. Um, you've got the way they look. You've got um, characters who whose problems are their problems, uh, things like that. So it's extremely choice-based and relationship-based. You can see that uh, in these characters that they also have these things called psychological limitations. What's actually quite interesting about that for this game is that they are not thespian directives. They are not saying, they're not contractual. My character will do this. My character won't do that. It has to do with how often they hit you that, and, and how extreme your response may be uh, but the responses are not mandated. So it's a really kind of interesting thing. You add to that the rules that are literally about losing control. And you realize that this character is dynamic in the way I described earlier, but it's also dynamic in your hands. Not only do you sort of say, okay, I have committed to reacting strongly under these certain circumstances, and I have some freedom about what that's, that reaction will be, but if I want, there's also... You don't have to take these. There's also ways you can even have the character go out of your control as a quantitative or mechanical issue. 
So the, I'm again talking about the boon. I'm going to play this character and I don't know how he's going to react when that happens or now that this has happened. Wow. You know, his reaction. Okay. It's going to be irrational. This is what I do. Or you even have a role there and say, well, geez, you know, is he going to lose it or not? Let's find out. So there's a great deal, this dynamic thing. I keep using that word over and over again. Um, played in this fashion, you can't play characters through a published adventure. People talk about, well, yeah, the adventure went off the rails or I lost control, you know, when the players did this and it's like in champions of this kind. Of course you did. What else did you expect? Why else were you playing except for that to happen? So we can move on uh, in looking at some of the other situations, just to contrast how many of them. Look across those characters in the, the red, and you will see how many of them are like that, with side effects and psychological limitations and all sorts of things, irrational all over the place. You know, I don't even have, I think, any enrages in there, but those are very popular among uh, Champions players. So... You know, you can imagine uh, a couple of those thrown in there, too. Okay, well, I mentioned about outcomes in the moment. And one thing I'd like to point out about the system is how, um, how thoroughly uh, you will get the impression when you look at it about what a metronomic wait your turn. This is my phase. This is my order in the phase. This is the maneuver that I choose. And this is all, this is the damage that I take and I count it down. This is my fatigue and I count it down. And it just looks like this dreadful kind of tick tock unnecessary thing until you'll recognize that that dynamism is hiding in there. That the point of the speed chart is not to follow it, but to change it up, to mess with it. There are ways that you subvert the speed chart, not to break the rules. These are the things that are your options. That, um, that one of the fascinating thing about resolution, this is the earliest instance, and it was a teaching instance for me at the time, where it says quite bluntly, if you're excited about the role and say something that's excited about, you know, the role as you go and are into it, get plus one, get plus two, go for it. That's cool. I didn't invent that for the Sorcerer bonus dice. I was following the instructions in this 1985 text. So uh, a few other things that uh, getting hit is not just a matter of ticking down your points, that the immediate moments of being hit actually change up circumstances dramatically in this game. The most fun is knockback, of course, but there are lots of others, um, such that a given event from the mechanics doesn't just put you in the same menu of options that you had a moment ago. And it, it's actually quite surprising, you know, getting into a champion's combat with characters whose listed features can exploit or make use of these dynamic details and with players who are oriented toward that, it's not this metronomic statistical grinds down of stun points. It is instead like holding a live wire, um, particularly if you start playing the environment as well and what breaks and stuff like that. The stuff over on the level, all of that, or the, in the yellow, all of it just goes even more so. I talked about the bonuses. Um, I should talk about the mechanic called presence, which is not subject to the speed chart and is spectacular in its impacts when timed properly. And then finally, the exhaustion rules, which are, you know, death on a stick for many, many games I have played. But in this case are fascinating because they allow you to rack up the effectiveness of the use of your powers and other things, um, but not knowing how much endurance you're going to lose from it. And the consequences of uh, endurance is that you can basically knock yourself out. So in many cases, uh, the game benefits when the problems are out of the range of the abilities of the characters as written on the sheet, 
But the pushing rules for endurance puts them in the position of trying to do it anyway. And again, that wonderful line from comics that's so hard to find in role-playing games, which is, I don't know if I can make it. We're going to see if I get enough effect when I push, and we're going to see just how much it knocks me down. So all of those are very active in playing champions. 